What is up, investors? It's Charlie here with another In the Green, and today I chatted with Ashton Nolan about his experience investing and how he hopes to have a positive impact on other investors. I'm at the bank making money, making moves, machines with tools and drills, making grooves, missions impossible. Hey, Ashton, how are you doing today? I'm good, Charlie. I'm, I'm good. It's an um, interesting week in the market. It's a short week on a holiday week, but... Um... You know, I'm living the American dream. I have no complaints. And uh, um, the market has been very, very kind to a lot of us the past few weeks. For sure. So could you just get us started by introducing yourself to the investor community? Who are you? Where are you from? And what's your background in, in investing? Absolutely. My name is Ashton Noland. Um, I am a self-taught uh, stock trader and investor. Um, I've been doing so since about 2015. So going on six years now. Um, born and raised in Kansas City, uh, go Chiefs. Um, we're right now currently located in Florida, um, enjoying the, the, the beach weather during the pandemic. And um, how I've gotten to where I am today, um, I'll, I'll just give you my, a brief synopsis of my, of my journey. Um, I actually started in the markets as a day trader uh, back in 2015. And I got started for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> which unfortunately a lot of people do. Um, I got started to, quote, become a full-time trader um, to escape a nine to five that I just, I just despised at that time. Um, and whenever you put that kind of pressure on yourself to become a, quote, full-time trader, especially as a day trader, um, it, it becomes exponentially more difficult. <laughs> and uh, I found that out the hard way. And um, by some sheer miracle, I just, I, I happened to figure it out after losing a lot of money my first year and then uh, I ended up day trading for about three and a half years and then just realized one day that day trading just was not for me long term. So I switched over to swing trading. Um, and all the while what I was doing whenever I was day trading um, and swing trading, uh, I was doing some investing. But even my investing journey has changed a lot over the past couple of years. Um, but <clears throat> Whenever earlier this year, I decided, I was like, you know what? I think a lot of people could, could uh, relate to my journey in particular. So I just took it to social media and just started documenting my journey and, and how I trade and what I've gone through and what I've overcome as a person and as a trader and as an investor and um, grew a nice, uh, a, a nice following on Instagram and TikTok as well. And um, I think documenting, documenting the documenting the journey um not just the gains but as well as the losses and everything in between i think that's very 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 important um and it keeps it keeps you humble i think um and i think uh a lot more people resonate with different journeys um, regardless of what people may think sometimes but um Right now, as of right now, I, I love my swing trading strategy. I love my investing strategy. I love where everything's at. And I love where I'm at mentally. Um, and I think at, in this day and age, there's so much wealth of knowledge and so many resources out there for people to learn. It's just the trick. You have to, look, you have to find out um, whatever strategy fits you as a person. That's the most important thing. So you say that you love your swing trading strategy and your current investing strategy. Could you talk a little bit about what, like, what those strategies are and how they've evolved over time to where they are now? Sure, sure. So my swing trading strategy, it all, it all started uh, with the simple thought of, hey, what are the most successful funds in the world? What are they doing? So I started doing some research on what investment funds do, what, in, what hedge funds do, because essentially these big funds, they're just a massive, massive swing trading fund is what they are, right? Um, now, swing trading and investing go hand in hand for sure. It's just a matter of the amount of time that you, in which you hold the position. So I started mimicking my strategy based on what I was seeing big funds do um, using using the same indicators, um, using the same time frame, And, and I, that's how it all started. And since then I've evolved that swing trading strategy using different indicators um, and just always uh, refining that. So my typical time frame on which I hold stocks is anywhere from two weeks to eight weeks. It just depends 
depends on the stock it depends on the setup and it's just it, there's a lot of different factors but i know that's a pretty wide range but uh that's about the length on which i hold my swing trades but my investing whenever i first started investing years and years ago i just did the the easiest thing you possibly could do and that was just invest in dividend companies right just very very passive but as i grew as a trader um, and became more familiar with the markets i became more of an active investor so really the past year um i switched completely over from well, it's kind of a transition i went from dividend only to eventually sprinkling in some value stocks like throwing in your walmarts and um you know your, your costcos you know big big brands like that and then i eventually started migrating from value over to growth companies. So over the past year and a half, I would say I've completely got away from uh, dividend investing altogether. Um, and there, there's a reason for that. One, because um, I've learned through years of studying and watching and observing on how to evaluate a company properly. Um, and, you know, growth companies do take on more risks, certainly. Um, but I think based on what I've, but based on my experience and what I've seen other people go through, um, if you learn to properly vet a company, a lot of that risk goes down. There's, there is still inherent risk for sure. Um, but I'm, I'm a young guy, I'm only 30 years old, so I, I can afford to take on a little more risk. So, um, so I, I, I completely got away from dividend investing. I'll throw in a value, a value play every once in a while, but for the most part, it's strictly growth for me. So you mentioned if you know how to evaluate a company's uh, risk, you can be much more successful. What does that process look like evaluating a growth stock's risk? Yeah, so this is a big, big, big thing. This is a big misconception a lot of, across a lot of new investors, right? The way you look at a, a dividend company is very, very different how you would approach and how you look at a growth company, right? Um, there are a lot of similarities. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot of overlap there. But the way, at the end of the day, the way you approach it and the way you look at these companies is very different. For example, um, if I wanted to evaluate a popular dividend play, like an ExxonMobil, for example, I would need to be paying attention um, if this was in fact a dividend play, I would need to be paying attention to things like their their uh, their dividend yield, of course. But you got to go deeper than that. You have to look at the amount of cash they have on hand. You have to look at their dividend payout ratio. Um, because if a dividend payout ratio is too high, then that may not look good long term. May not be very sustainable for a dividend, right? So you have to look at those sorts of things. But as a as a um, as a growth play, let's say. Um, you look more into the future, the potential of the, the company in the future. Well, obviously none of these growth companies pay a dividend because they're not well established enough, right? But a couple of things that you would wanna pay attention to is the revenue growth, right? Because a lot of these growth companies aren't even profitable yet, right? Actually majority of them aren't. So you need to pay attention to the revenue growth, um, their net income. And when, when do you see in the foreseeable future or when does the company project that the company will become profitable, right? Could be next quarter, could be the next year, two years, three years, right? And um, another big thing that I really, really take into consideration on growth companies is the company's total addressable market, right? There has to be a big market available for that company's products or that company's services. Um, and one of my favorite growth plays right now um, is Open Door. They they actually just uh, finalized their merger with they, they went through a SPAC. They were IPOB and they just switched, switched over to OPEN as of yesterday. Um, and the reason why I like them so much is because uh, their total addressable market. They're they're trying to completely disrupt a much needed. Uh, disrupted market and that is the real estate market the online real estate market now you have competitors such as zillow zillow would be a direct competitor of theirs um but i think open door based on what their the market they're trying to tackle and how they're going about it with their tech and their their uh, their ui and ux on the back end of their website i think can be a complete game changer um 
And then you also have to consider for growth companies, what are these companies' market caps compared to their competitors? So for example, I use an open door, um, they're a fraction of the market cap as to their direct competitor is Zillow. So we obviously see that there's plenty of growth available there. It's just a matter of whether or not that company can fulfill that, you know, what they're, what they're trying to do and actually follow through. Definitely. You mentioned earlier on, you tried to in ways mimic what like big hedge funds are doing. Um, but like one risk I know of that is if you're behind them, uh, in time, if you do what they're doing, but slightly behind, if a bunch of big funds are doing something, they could end up moving the market in a way where you're kind of behind and not able to take advantage of that. So like, how are you able to still take advantage of that? Are you able to get ahead of these funds that funds that you're mimicking, or are you still able to take advantage even if you're doing things after these big funds? That is a brilliant point. And this is where a lot of new traders, a lot of new investors, that a lot of people fall into this trap. And I'll use a very, very popular fund as an example for this, and that is ARK Invest. They are exploding in popularity, especially amongst the, the younger crowds, you know, guys like you and me. Here's the thing. Whenever I mimicked uh, what the big funds were doing, that was strictly for trading, okay? And I wasn't mimicking actual exact stocks. I was just mimicking, trying to find out what their strategy was. So that way I can, I can mimic that to a degree, yes, but I want to tailor that to my own liking as time goes on. That's strictly for trading. So that way I can apply that to any stock. Investing, I've seen so many people just crash and burn because of this. You know, they'll, they'll simply buy whatever they see ARK Invest buying. That is very, very dangerous because one thing that they, what new investors may not realize is that uh, ARK Invest may, they hold a huge position in, position in Tesla, right? So somebody may, may see that today, but what they don't know is that, or may not know, um, is that they're currently, currently selling some Tesla. So while somebody sees that ARK is currently holding Tesla. Yes, they may be buying it for the first time today just because ARK owns it, but they may not know that, they be, that they're that they selling their position um, or at least offloading because what, what are they doing? They're essentially restructuring their portfolio, right? Um, so there's a lot more that goes into it. Furthermore, um, if, if ARK owns a position in, let's say, Lemonade, for example, um, they could have bought that position or started to accumulate that position two years ago, right? So that means they, they, their cost basis could be substantially lower. And so that means they could, be, they could have been, been playing a completely different game two years ago, right? So blindly following, following big funds and as to what they're buying, it, I mean, that is extremely, extremely dangerous. But here's, here's the thing though. If somebody looks at a company that a big fund owns and they look through it, they look through their financials, they believe in the company, they know it extremely well. They, they know, you know information about the CEO, their board of directors, et cetera. Then that, that's a little bit of a different story, but blindly jumping into stocks just because someone else does is, is never a good thing. Gotcha, that's helpful to know. You mentioned that you have a uh, big following on multiple different social media platforms. How did that happen? How did you grow this kind of big user base who, uh, who follow you? Um, well, <laughs> big following, that's, that's relative. I call it a big following just because I'm extremely grateful. You know, I'm just some random dude who trades stocks and, you know, that's just, it's, so I'm extremely grateful and just never ceases to amaze me. But um, one thing that I like to do, and I think a lot of people appreciate, is I like to add some element of entertainment to it. And there's a reason for that. I do that very intentionally. And that is because the stock market, trading or investing, whichever, can be a pretty daunting thing, pretty overwhelming thing for a lot of people. And I think adding an element of entertainment to it um, brings down those barriers to a lot of people, right? Um, but the main, the main thing on my content across Instagram and TikTok is teaching. Right now, and I just teach what I know. I just teach what I do because that's, I mean, I can't, I can't teach um, options because I'm not an options trader. Right? I'm a stock 
swing trader and an investor. So I just teach what I know. Um, and for some people, the way I handle things may not resonate with them. That's completely fine. And that's why that's one of the reasons why I like the investor app so much is because, you know, you, you have, you can go in there and compete against different people and, and we're all human beings. We like to compete just naturally. Plus there's the archives. You can go in there and learn and, and then you can pick and choose uh, how you want to learn. You know, I, and I think that's really, really important. Um, but I think, I think the biggest thing though, for, for my growth on social media is just being very, very transparent, you know, with, with my, with my trades, um, you know, I'll show my losses and I'll dissect my losses. That is extremely important because, um, I mean, we, we all know this, we all know that people who don't show their losses, uh, we all know that's, that's a little better than advertised probably because lot losing is all part of it, you know, um, and documenting how a certain trader or a certain investor gets through that loss, how they, um, identify it, how they work through it, how they move on after the loss. And I, I think showing those aspects of it is, is so important as a, as your growth, um, as a trader and investor. Definitely. Uh, so to transition a little bit to kind of more of a forward looking focus, where do you see the market going uh, as we enter 2021 for the first few months? What, what do you think is going to happen? Man, here's, here's the thing. I, I, I really, really don't like predicting where I think the market is going to go. What I, what I like to do is I just react to what I see. Right. Because um, I mean, let's, let's, let's be honest. I think if, if somebody were to predict the market and try to predict the market, nobody knows where the market's going to go. And if we did, or if we had even the sliver of an idea, we would all be billionaires, <laughs> multi-billionaires, right? So, um, and that's one of the things I, I did as a day trader was I would always try to anticipate and I was always sorely disappointed. So I've, always, I've, I've learned just to, just to rest easy, let the market do the heavy lifting and then just react to what the market's telling me. But um, I will say this, the past couple of days have been interesting. Um, I, I use the SPY as my gauge, just the ETF of the S&P 500. And this, you have to have some kind of line of demarcation, you know, for, for yourself personally, right? And my line of demarcation is using the 20, 20 day simple moving average on the SPY, just pulling it up on a daily chart and say, okay, where are we relative to that line? Because that gives me the average price over the last trading month, right? And if we're, if we're below that, price tends to creep down just a little bit further into, until the next support area or wherever that is. But if we're above it, then individual stocks tend to follow suit and, and, you know, the spy is kind of like the canary in the coal mine. Right. Um, and as of right now, we're throttling right on that 20 day. And I think whenever we tend to throttle that line, it's because there's a lot of uncertainty. Right. And I think um, the uncertainty with the vaccine, uncertainty with the stimulus package. I know we got that, the government got that approved, um, but it, there's still uncertainty as to when people will get it. The market does not like uncertainty, <laughs> right? Um, and I think we're in a level of uncertainty right now, but I will say this, um, going into the next decade, um, I do believe that we could see gains in individual stocks like we've never seen before. Um, because people think that we're in a stock bubble and actually Kathy Wood of ARK Invest, and she said it perfectly. And I, and I agree with her. She said that we're not actually in a stock bubble, bubble we're actually in a bond bubble. Um, because, uh, companies and, and corporations were buying, uh, debt during, during the pandemic in forms of bonds. So now, uh, she believes, and I believe too, that we could actually see that influx of bonds being transitioned over to equities. And I think over the next decade, we could see a very, very, very bullish run. Um, I could be very, very wrong, but that's, that's, that's what I'm seeing. Um, that's what I think will happen. Interesting uh, thoughts there. Um, well, maybe to rephrase my question, what things, because you said you're not maybe looking, you don't like to predict, you like to see and kind of look back. 
what things will you be looking at? Like what sectors or instruments will you be watching particularly closely over the course of the next few months to maybe see where things might be going? Yeah, I think, uh, I think there are a few sectors that stick out like a sore thumb right now. Um, obviously the, the EV space, electrical vehicles. I mean, some people believe the EV space is in a bubble. I, I would definitely listen to that argument for sure because um, I mean, we've seen several EV uh, companies run up, so several EV SPACs run up over the course of the pandemic. A lot have crashed and burned since then. Uh, Nikola being the, the prime candidate of that. Uh, Hylion is another one. Um, but EV is definitely something that is, and NEO being another one for sure, and obviously Tesla. Um, but I do think that is going to be one of the biggest, hottest sectors in the next five, 10 years. That's what, I, that's what I think. And Tesla is actually one of my uh, largest holdings personally. Um, and I've been, I've been a shareholder of Tesla for almost two years. So Tes I love Tesla as a company. Um, so you got the EV space. And I also think uh, the genomics sector. And I actually graduated college, college with a, um, a chemistry and biology degree. So I'm well-versed. I don't say well-versed. I mean, I'm not a doctor by any means, but um, I know a lot of the lingo um, when it comes to the genomic sector. And what I, whenever I invest in growth companies, I look into companies that are going to completely pioneer an entire sector. And I think the genom genomic sector in general is just going to completely change the world in the next handful of years, probably within the next 10 years. Um, and one of my other big holdings is CRISPR therapeutics. And uh, the, the, way, the, the technology that they're, they are using um, is just incredible. They're looking to cure a lot of diseases that have not been curable for quite some time. Um, so genomic sector is another one to look at. And then another, and obviously cloud computing, cloud software, cloud storage, anything to do with cloud uh, is gonna be huge. And I, I, I personally don't think people can quite comprehend how big that industry is gonna be. Um, because with the, with the improvement of technology, improvement in AI, improvement in, in just in, in everything, VR, um, that, that industry is just gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger um, and more, more advanced and more intricate. And there's a lot of uh, new companies um, in the cloud space that are really starting to come out. And um, I have my eye on a couple. I have not pulled the trigger on any of them yet because a lot of them are overvalued right now. <laughs> but um, that's another sector. And then obviously the streaming, uh, the streaming sector. You know, Disney is obviously a huge player, which I'm very, very impressed with Disney and, and what they've done with Disney Plus. Um, and you ha also have a new, a new player on the scene, which is Fubo TV. They've been hot topic the past week or so. Been eyeing them, and that stock just will not come down as of today. Um, and of course, you have Netflix and uh, a few others. So I think those are the big ones. So the last question I like to ask a lot of people who come on here is say someone's reaching out to you. So like say someone DMs you saying they've never invested before. They're a young person. Where do I start? What should I be thinking about? You have 30 seconds to tell them what they should be thinking about. What do you say? Surround yourself with everything and anything investing in anything stocks, whether that be YouTube, books, uh, podcasts, anything, because you have to take the shotgun approach initially to find out what appeals to you. And then whenever, whenever you find a strategy, um, an investing strategy or trading strategy that appeals to you, laser focus on that one thing and don't pay attention to any other white noise. Awesome. That's great advice. Thank you, Ashton, for coming on the podcast today. You were uh, great to listen to and definitely very, I learned a lot from you. Thanks, Charlie, man. It's, it's always fun to talk stocks. I could do this until I'm blue in the face. So I appreciate your time. Man. I am not a financial advisor and my comment should never be taken as financial advice. Investments come with risk. So always do your research and analysis before. Now,